Hello, this is Apostle Nataki Tompkins, and you're listening to Worship Center Radio, the platform of champions. Plant a seed and watch it grow. One dollar is all it takes to make a difference. Visit www.worshipcenterradio.net and click the banner on the right-hand side and sow a seed to Worship Center Radio, the platform of champions. From Detroit to the nations, you are listening to the world's number one Christian station, Worship Center Radio, the platform of champions. Welcome to Love Broke the Chains with your host, Apostle Nataki Tompkins. Hello everyone and welcome back to Love Broke the Chains with me, your host, Apostle Nataki Tompkins. I am so glad to be before you once again. Uh, We are going to continue in our topic uh, that we have been discussing for the last couple of weeks, uh, the movie Audacity. Uh, We had discussed the movie itself, and then we moved into uh, some questions that came from the chat room. And then we began covering questions that I pulled from the movie. And so we have not finished it yet, so we're going to continue in covering the questions from the movie. I have to tell you honestly that this has been a very interesting A couple of weeks that we have experienced discussing this topic. And the reason why is because there has been airway attack uh, for several different reasons, Um, but yet we prevail. Amen. We that are part of the kingdom of heaven who uh, have the Most High God, our Heavenly Father, uh, protecting us, and and we are sons and daughters of His. We are protected, and we are going to be steadfast and absolutely determined to continue in delivering the Word of God to you because we believe that the Word is truly powerful, that it does change and transform lives. And we also believe that the enemy does not have any authority over us, amen, or over God's word. And so we're going to continue in on discussing this topic. And I'm excited, actually, because uh, I believe that that those of you who have tuned in live or whether you have listened to our broadcast at a later time when it was more convenient for you, that you have had questions answered. Uh, You have been provoked to uh, think about your position. Uh, You have been challenged to uh, take your Uh, relationship with the Lord to another level, or you are now in the process of really thinking about the Word of God and really beginning to understand uh, His love for you and how He really wants you to come in relationship with Him so that you can be all that He has called you to be as well as become who he has intended for you to be before the foundation of this world. So I'm excited about the work that is being done uh, over these last few weeks discussing this particular topic. And I look forward to the coming weeks uh, to discuss more uh, uh, challenging topics because this is the time now where we have to address all these things. We have to take away uh, any second guessing. We have to take away doubt. We have to take away unbelief. And and please stay tuned because I am going to discuss the spirit of unbelief. 
Okay, because once unbelief is destroyed out of your life, truly uh, the word tells us that all things are possible for those whom believe. And so you will truly be a believer, not only in Christ the Messiah to obtain your salvation, but you will become a true believer in the power of God because the power of God is real. And that power is like none other. You can have a lot of things going on in your life, uh, a lot of turmoil, a lot of ups and downs. But it's something about when we allow Christ in our life. It's something about when we begin seeing the manifestation of the power of God working in our lives that it just literally overtakes and annihilates those things that were keeping us in bondage and really preventing us from fulfilling the things that we are to fulfill, as well as uh, it equips us that even though we will have challenges arise in our life, that it will not overtake us. It does not have the ability to harm us because the Lord told us in John chapter 16 that he has uh, taken the power back from those things in life that could harm us. And that is what makes us more than conquerors because he has already conquered it. So I want you to even go look at John chapter 16, verse 33, and really begin to meditate on that word because we all need to be encouraged and we need to be strengthened that no matter what we face, that as long as we have Christ in our life, then we have everything that we need. We know that one of the attributes of our Heavenly Father is our uh, uh, El Shaddai, our God that is more than enough. He is the all-breasted one. So anything that it is that we need, we can pull upon him because he is the one that is the provisionary for everything that is needed in order for us to have a successful life. Amen. So we all want to have a successful life. We want to have life and life more abundantly as our Lord told us in John chapter 10. And so we want to experience life with him in superior in quality as well as quantity. Amen. We want to live a life that is uh, beyond the norm, living beyond what we are just in need of. And so we are able to obtain that when we are in relationship with the Lord and the blessing of the Lord is operating in our lives. It is because we enter into a relationship with him that we become equipped with everything that it is that we need to do those things that we would not be able to do in our natural ability. Amen. That's, that is one of the definitions of, of a blessing is that we are endowed with the power with the ability to do things some uh, to do things uh, supernaturally okay because we would not be able to do those things in our own natural state so that sets a precedence that we are always in need of Christ the Messiah that we need him in our lives amen so, Father, we just thank you. We glorify your name, even for the word that you have began to speak in our lives right now. Holy Spirit, you already know that you are completely in control. You are the one that has control over my tongue. I submit my mind unto you. I submit myself unto your purpose that needs to be manifested here unto the people. I thank you and I glorify your name, Lord, that as I decrease, you will increase in me. <coughs> 
I thank you and I glorify your name right now, Lord God, that you have literally cleared the airways, that there will be no disruption in the mighty name of Jesus. I thank you and I glorify your name, Lord God, that as you breathe, Lord God, when your breath hits the place and where it is going, it will literally transform and change the atmosphere and the people in the mighty name of Jesus. I ask for your help right now, Lord, that you will completely take over this broadcast in the mighty name of Jesus and all of the information that you want to be discussed today. Let it be so in Jesus name. Amen. And so I said that, (coughs) excuse me, that we were going to pick up uh, with the questions from the movie uh, and, and Last week, I uh, covered questions one and question number two. And the two questions that I talked about was, can we be born gay? And the other one uh, was, does God damn people to hell? So I'm asking everyone, if you did miss that broadcast, please make sure that you uh, visit our archive so that you can listen to it. And and God is continually opening up doors. So whether you are a visual person, uh, you also have the ability to uh, see us on YouTube as well or you stream. So please go back, listen to the broadcast, amen, and and it will bless you, I truly believe. And if you have any questions, if you have any comments, please send them because we do not want any uh, questions left unanswered, amen. We do not want you to be uh, confused about any information. And at the same time, if you desire prayer, Please send a message to Love Broke the Chains at gmail.com, or you could even go to Love Broke the Chains.com and, and click on comment and send something to me because I want to make sure, amen, that you get all of the information that is needed. Praise God. All right, so the third question that we are going to pick up on is what does God think about homosexuality. And I can tell you right off the bat that God considers homosexuality a sin. Without a shadow of a doubt, it is not acceptable in the eyes of God. You know, I could go back from the beginning of the word in Genesis where he created male and female. And in the beginning, male and female came together. That was Adam and Eve. That was just a divine plan that the father himself, the creator himself, put into place as well as established. And so when man begins to interfere with the plan of God, everything becomes distorted. And a lot of times what happens is that, you know, there is a demonic influence uh, that will try to interfere with the original plan or not sometimes it's all the time that uh, the enemy will try to interfere with the very divine plan the very divine nature of God and so we have to know what the word of God tells us about homosexuality if any of us have truly excuse me, accepted Christ in our life, then we have already taken the position that God's word is true, that we acknowledge that uh, our lives needed to be changed in the only way that it would change is by accepting Christ. See, when you accept Christ in your life, it does not mean that you save yourself from Uh, eternal damnation, okay? What that means is that Christ is the door. He is the way. He is the life. So we need to receive him as our Lord and Savior. But our journey 
does not end just there. Just because you confess Christ as your Lord and Savior is not going to keep you from spending an eternity in hell. God has a word that he has given us that we must live by. And we must be faithful in living by his word. And as we are faithful in living in his word, then we will develop a relationship with him and truly spending an eternity and glory in heaven will happen for us. Amen. But I think that we should all keep in mind that the life that we live when that day comes for us, whether it be before the rapture uh, or at rapture time, we all are going to have to go before our Heavenly Father, and He will be sitting as the judge. And so it is Him that is going to judge our lives and how we lived it, and, and He is going to judge us whether or not we fulfilled the very purpose in which we were created for here in this earth. He is going to judge the events of of our life. He is the judge and we are going to be judged according to righteousness, his righteousness. Amen. Because our righteousness is as filthy rags. Praise God. So homosexuality is a sin. And I'm actually going to go through scripture, each scripture to read to you what the word of God says. And if you have your Bibles, <coughs> I ask that you follow along so that you can read it for yourself. So the first scripture that we are going to go to is going to be Leviticus chapter 18. You know, since I've been in this area of ministry, uh, I have heard plenty of people uh, call the scriptures that we're going to go over, uh, those who are part of the LGBT community, um, they call these the clobber scriptures that uh, uh, Christians use. And, and can I just say this, and I've said this in time past, that these are not clobber scriptures, okay? These are scriptures that we as Christians uh, live by, that we as Christians have to be obedient to. There is no changing the word for it to fit uh, your life and, and, and fit your culture. The word of God is universal and it is going to be in place for all times. The Bible tells us that heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will not. So Leviticus chapter 18 verse 22 says, You are not to go to bed with a man as with a woman, it is an abomination. Now, let's go over to chapter 20 of Leviticus. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm really going to get over this cough. Leviticus chapter 20. Verse 13 says, if a man goes to bed with a man as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They must be put to death. Their blood is on them. Now, let's go over to uh, the New Covenant in Romans chapter 1. You know what's interesting is that when we look at Romans chapter 1. We're actually looking at. Siblings in Christ being spoken to. And the reasons why. The, the reasons. Singular I should say. The reason why I say that. 
is because in scripture it tells us that they once knew the word and that they turned their back on it. And of course, I'm paraphrasing. So I am going to pick up. I'm going to pick up with verse 20. I hesitated because I didn't know if I wanted to uh, start with verse 23. (coughs) Excuse me. Verse 20. For ever since the creation of the universe, his invisible qualities, both his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly seen because they can be understood from what he has made. Therefore, they have no excuse because although they know who God is, They do not glorify him as God or thank him. On the contrary, they have become futile in their thinking and their undiscerning hearts have become darkened. Claiming to be wise, they have become fools. In fact, they have exchanged the glory of the immortal God for mere images, like a mortal human being or like birds, animals, or reptiles. Verse 24, this is why God has given them up to the vileness of their hearts' lusts, to the shameful misuse of each other's bodies. They have exchanged the truth of God for falsehood by worshiping and serving created things rather than the creator. Praise be he forever. Verse 26, this is why God has given them up to to degrading passions so that their women exchange natural sexual relations for unnatural and likewise the men committing shameful acts with other men and receiving in their own persons the penalty appropriate to their perversion. In other words, since they have not considered God worth knowing, God has given them up to worthless ways of thinking so that they do improper things. They are filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and vice, stuffed with jealousy, murder, quarreling, dishonesty, and ill will. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God. They are insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They plan evil schemes, They disobey their parents. They are brainless, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. They know well enough God's righteous decree that people who do such things deserve to die. Yet not only do they keep doing them, but they applaud others who do the same. So see, that verse... I'm sorry, not verse, that book and verses that we read were not for unbelievers. That was for believers or former believers who initially had claimed Christ as their Lord and Savior and acknowledged that God is who he is. And they have exchanged the wisdom of God, the righteousness of God, the true unadulterated word of God, they exchanged it to fulfill the lusts of their flesh. And the Bible tells us that when we walk in the spirit, then we will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And if we walk in the flesh and continue to do so, then we are walking in our old nature 
We have not allowed the new nature that comes when we receive Christ as our lot in our life to to take over. And so we cannot treat our heavenly Father as a man that is flesh, as a mere image. It is him only that is spirit. Therefore, we are spirit, okay? It's just a body that we house temporarily while we are here in the earth. Yet I will remind you that there is a place that we will rest eternally. But that place is determined by you based upon you receiving Christ as your Lord and Savior, as well as if you are obedient to his word. The Lord said that those who love him obey his commandments. <clears throat> I have now turned over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and I am going to read to you verses 9 and 10. And I may even do 11 because 11 is a verse of hope. 11 is a verse that has showed deliverance. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You know what? I'm going to go. Okay. I'm, I'm going to start 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 9. Don't you know that unrighteous people will have no share in the kingdom of God. Don't delude yourselves. People who engage in sex before marriage, who worship idols, who engage in sex after marriage with someone other than their spouse, who engage in active or passive homosexuality, who steal, who are greedy, who get drunk, who assail people with contemptuous language, who rob, none of them will share in the kingdom of God. Verse 11, here is our scripture of hope and deliverance. Some of you use to do these things, but you have been cleansed. I'm sorry, you have cleansed yourselves. You have been set apart for God. You have come to be counted righteous through the power of the Lord Yeshua, the Messiah, and the Spirit of our God. I'm reading from the complete Jewish Bible. So we can see out of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, that there are multiple things that the Lord finds unpleasing in his sight, and they are unlawful according to his rules and regulations, according to the word that he has established for us to live by. Now let's take a look at Galatians chapter 5, as well as 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1. But we're going to go over to Galatians chapter 5 first. Not too many people cover Galatians chapter 5, but we are. Galatians chapter 5, I'm going to read to you verses 19 through 21. And it is perfectly evident what the old nature does. It expresses itself in sexual immorality, impurity, and indecency, involvement with the occult and with drugs, in feuding, fighting, becoming jealous, and getting angry, in selfish ambition, factionalism, intrigue, and envy, in drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you now, as I have warned you before, those who do such things will have no share in the kingdom of God. People, we must take a personal review of our life and compare it to the word and see if it lines up. If it does not, then we need to seriously consider 
making a real commitment unto the Lord so that we can follow his word. And remember that the, the, that the word told us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 that it is by the power of the Lord Yeshua, Christ the Messiah, that the changes were made in the people's life. You know, I, I hear a lot of people say that, well, I've tried to leave the life of homosexuality and it did not work for me. Well, I ask you this question and seriously think about it. Did you submit your life? Uh, aside from just asking the Lord, what actual changes did you begin to make? Had, you, had your mind and your heart become one in making the decision that your flesh was not going to rule and that God rules, that God is sovereign? Because when that decision is made, we will do what is necessary. We will then be able to live a sacrificial life before the Lord and allow him to begin the process of changing us so that we can be delivered from those things, not just homosexuality, okay, but from anything that we have covered in Scripture thus far. It is only by the power of our Lord that these things are accomplished. I'll give you an example. Before receiving Christ in my life, I would drink every day. I would smoke weed every day. Uh, I'm going to use the old expression of I would cuss like a sailor, okay? And it was when I really committed my life to the Lord. And when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, that the process of change began. And as I committed my life, and as I committed to speak in tongues and, and really develop my language and begin to cooperate with the Holy Spirit so that the power of the Lord could begin that change, I stopped smoking weed, have no idea, couldn't tell you when I stopped. It was immediately that it stopped. I stopped drinking every single dog on day, had no desire for it. I also stopped using profanity. Now, I'll tell you this because this was funny. This is hilarious. So I was working for uh, Rite Aid, okay? I don't, I've been, been gone from there for a little while, so I really don't care about telling you where I used to work. So I was working for Rite Aid, and I was an assistant manager in a store, and so there was this pharmacist that just really would get up under my skin. And so he said something this particular day, and I was uh, in the front of the store, and I was facing items, you know, pushing items to the front to make it all nice and pretty and presentable for all of my customers that come in, you know, making their shopping experience just totally awesome, right? Right. And so he said something to me that, you know, obviously when I heard it, it did not make me happy. Y'all, I started cussing him out. And I, after I cussed him out, I said, I said, see what you made me do? <laughs> you made me cuss. Now I got to go repent. <laughs> and I literally said this to this man. But it goes to show you that even though I sinned before God, I was conscious of that sin. I was God conscious because immediately my spirit came to the forefront and said, daughter, you out of order. You need to repent before your Lord because you know you are not supposed to use profanity. And so that's my little fun story. Now. We're going to go over to 1 Timothy chapter 1, like I said. <clears throat> 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10 says. Okay, let's go back to verse 9. Y'all even do this in my church. 
I do. Please, thank you. I do this in my church. You know how how uh, I'm sure uh, your pastors do the same thing. Like we have something that's written down, right? And then once we begin looking at the scripture, uh, you know, we are like, mm, just so everyone can can understand exactly what we are saying, we go up a couple of verses or one verse. So I do this all the time. I'm at home with you. So get used to it. OK, so we're actually going to start with verse nine. Scripture reads, we are aware that the Torah is not for a person who is righteous but for those who are heedless of Torah and rebellious, thank you, bro, ungodly and sinful, wicked and worldly, for people who kill their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexual and moral, both heterosexual and homosexual. So just if I stopped right there, right? Just to let y'all know that you can be in sexual sin even if you are not homosexual. The bottom line is that if you are not married to an individual and you are having sex with them, sweetheart, you are in sin, okay? If you are a married individual and you are having relations outside of your covenant, sweetheart, you are in sin and you are in need of repentance. So I suggest that you go over to 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 and confess your sins so that the Father can cleanse you from all unrighteousness and you can get back into right standing with him. Praise you, Lord, for water. All right. So, slave dealers, liars, perjurers, and anyone who acts contrary, contrary to the sound teaching that accords with the good news of the glorious and blessed God. So again, I ask you, does your life line up? with the word of God, because if it does not, my beloved, you are in sin. Now, hopefully that answers the question uh, accurately for you, uh, and, and it satisfies uh, your doubt, uh, not satisfying your flesh, not satisfying your natural mind, because it is unable to receive it but that the spirit of the living God rises up on the inside of you and that scripture bears witness with your spirit and you have receded, received the evidence that you needed in order to make the final determination that homosexuality is a sin. The fourth question is, what does it mean to accept Christ in your heart. Now I have scripture here. <clears throat> but I want to talk to you just from my heart. When we talk about. Accepting Christ. In our heart. This is a relational. Love affair. That we enter with the Lord. It's as if you enter into a marriage with someone whom you should have spent enough time with to know who they are, to know what their likes are, to know what their dislikes are, to know what excites them, to know what upsets them, to come to a place where you love them so much that you desire to honor them in everything that you do. That you look for ways just to bless them and be good to them. 
that when you see them, a smile comes upon your face. There is joy that rises in your heart because you two are now in the same place. You are in each other's presence. It is as if you cannot live without that individual. And despite the ups and downs that you may experience, the, the heated conversations, as one of my sisters, Prophet Charlotte, says, heated conversations, you still love that individual. That the love that you have with this person is not uh, eros, is not that flesh love. But it is the agape love, the love of God, the love that is unconditional, that love that is unfailing. That is the relation, no love relationship that we are to have with the Lord, that we consider only to be pleasing or not considered, that we live pleasing in his sight, that we come to a place where we cannot live without him, that we come to a place that even though we may not understand or we are unhappy about uh, uh, separating from things that we may enjoy because he has become our first love, because we have fell in love with him, because we know that he only desires the best for us, because we understand that he is the God of eternity and he knows the beginning to the end and the end from the beginning. Well, we want to do just because we love him what he says. And he's so awesome that his word tells us that if we delight in his law, that he will give us the desires of our heart. And so we need to have this love affair with the Lord. We need to understand that we do not use him just to gain entry into heaven. No, when we accept Christ in our heart, we enter into a forever and eternal relationship with him. We get excited to have the ability to communicate with him, to talk with him, to walk with him. You know, the word tells us in John that, you know, if we are faithful to him and if we love him, that they will make their abode in us. They who the father, the son and the Holy Spirit. Their home, their permanent home will be made in us and us in them. You know, to, to show the permanence in which Christ desires to have with us. The, the Lord has even told us that we are the temples, the tabernacles of the Holy Spirit. And so the tabernacle in the old covenant is where the presence of the Lord would dwell. And so we want the presence of the Lord to dwell with us. You know, I say all the time that, Holy Spirit, I want you to be my habitation and not my visitation. I don't want the Holy Spirit just to visit me. I want him to reside with me. I cannot live without the Holy Spirit. If it wasn't for him, I would not be here before you today. If it was not for him, I would not walk in power and authority. If it wasn't for him, trust me, I would not be walking with the level of the love of God that I have. If it was not for him, I would not have the word of God written upon my heart. If it was not for him, I would not be alive today. I would not have the things that I have in my life. I need him. I desire him. I long for him. I do not, I do not, my beloved, desire to ever be without him. He is my first love. So, <coughs> If you look at Romans chapter 9, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 10, verses 9, 10, and 13, you will find scripture that will have you confess Christ as your Lord and Savior. Now, you must believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that you believe 
Christ died on the cross for you, and that God rose him from the dead. And that the only way you are going to receive eternal life is through accepting Christ in your life. That's your salvation. Now, when you look at relationship, because that's what he wants us to have, you would have to look at Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. And as, you know, one becomes mature in their relationship, you know, the Lord told uh, his disciples to go out and preach the word everywhere, immersing everyone in, in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey the commands of of the Lord. And so that's Matthew 28 verses 19 and 20. And so yes, those of us that are founded in the word and we have matured in our relation in our relationship with the Lord, we are to teach those to obey God's commands. In John chapter 14 verse 15 and 21, it speaks of loving the Lord enough to follow his commands. When you look at Mark chapter 8, verses 34 and 35, the word of God tells us to deny ourselves, our own fleshly desires, and take up our cross to follow him. If you look at Romans chapter 12, uh, verse 1 through 3, it says, stop being conformed to this world and be transformed by the renewing of the mind. Okay, that is through the word of God that this is going to take place. This is going to happen as we come into agreement with what God has already established. And not only do we come into agreement with what he has already established, we are satisfied with it. And a, a, a previous uh, broadcast, I questioned whether or not a person is satisfied with God and with his word. Because we have to be satisfied in order to truly accept that which he is requiring from us. Because once you're satisfied with something, there is nothing to question. You just do it. And you do it because you believe in it. You do it because you believe it's right. You do it because you know it is beneficial. And so I ask you, are you satisfied with what God has called good? Because that is what you need to come into agreement with. Question number five is, will good deeds or being a good person keep you from spending an eternity in hell? This one doesn't even have to do with homosexuality itself. I pulled this out of the movie because uh, a young lady that Ray Comfort was interviewing said she believed that heaven was her home because she's doing what God wants her to do by going to school, uh, by doing uh, good things, and she thinks that she is a good person. Here's what I say to that. I have actually a couple of things to say to that. Is that if you look at scripture, <clears throat> when the Lord was approached by the rich young ruler, he greeted him by saying, good rabbi. And the Lord said to him, why do you call me good? The only one that is good is my father. And so an individual cannot look at themselves as being good just in their flesh. What makes us good is our heavenly father. What makes us good is accepting Christ as our Lord and Savior so that we can enter into relationship and be uh, uh, connected to the Father because Christ is the one that reconciles us to a relationship 
with our Heavenly Father. See, in the book of Genesis, in the beginning, it was God that established what was good. And so it is only by what he calls good do we become good. See, our own flesh cannot be good because we are told in Romans chapter 5 that, that we were born in sin. There's a sinful nature that comes along with it. See, this is why we need to experience a rebirthing by accepting Christ as our Lord and Savior so that we can become a new creature in Christ. This is what is going to begin the process of a transformation in a way that we think. We begin to acknowledge that God is sovereign, that he is supreme, that he is the creator, and that we want to get back to our God identity so that we can be in the image and likeness in which he made us. See, that's a spiritual thing, not a physical thing. And so we have to walk according to his word and according to his ways in order for this to happen. And so the Bible also tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, this is a scripture that I often use when I'm out uh, uh, evangelizing. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 and 9 says, For you have been delivered by grace, through trusting, and some translations say faith. And even this is not your accomplishment, but God's. You were not delivered by your own actions. Therefore, no one should boast. So it has nothing to do with how many good deeds you do. It has nothing to do with you being a good person. It has everything to do with the sacrifice that Christ made on the cross. The blood that he shed for us. The torment, the ridicule that he had to endure for us that we receive this wonderful gift of salvation. You know, there's a movie that God really spoke to me about him, uh, and that was The Matrix. And if you haven't seen it, go check it out. Uh, and, and if you have seen it, I suggest that you go back and you look at it because that is a very spiritual movie, very spiritual. And I find it interesting that um, uh, Mordecai, or not uh, Mordecai, Lord, I'm in the book of Esther, Morpheus, uh, presented Neo, the chosen one, with two pills. The red pill and the blue pill. Now, I do not take it as a coincidence. I believe it was on purpose that the red pill is the one that exposed truth. It was the blue pill that would keep you in deception. The red pill, to me, is a picture of the blood. And when we accept the blood that was shed upon the cross through Christ is when we are exposed to truth. Amen? So go look at that movie. How much time do I have? Okay. Number six question was, don't most Christians hate gays? This was a question that was presented uh, in the movie when a Christian, uh, I forgot his name already, doggone it, uh, when he um, intervened on their behalf when there was a, a, a person that was trying to rob the gas station and the robber uh, was frantic 
And so he was getting ready to shoot the two gentlemen that were in a homosexual relationship. And uh, the Christian intervened on their behalf and said, no, don't shoot them, shoot me. And so when you have a relationship with the Lord, you don't have to be concerned about this carnal life, this, this earthly life in which we live in, because we have already established that heaven is going to be our home. And I will add again that this individual had to be in right standing with the Lord in order for him to make a comment like that, right? If you are not in right standing with the Lord, I suggest you not make that comment. And uh, they wanted to thank him, and so they went out to dinner. And so they found out that he was Christian because, of course, he did not broadcast it, so they didn't know. But uh, they asked him the question, why would you do this? He said, well, I'm Christian. Basically, I know where my home is. And so they said, oh, you're Christian. Oh, my goodness. It just raised flags in their heads. And so when they uh, were seated, uh, they began conversating. And so one of the gentlemen uh, that was homosexual said, well, don't most Christians, Christians hate gays. And so he said no. And so this is what I want to say, that uh, for those of us who have received Christ in our lives, uh, we have to be obedient to the word, and we are obedient to two commandments. And those two commandments is to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our strength, as well as uh, love the Lord, I'm sorry, to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And so you can find those scriptures uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, as well as Leviticus chapter 19, uh, verse 18. And so I want to leave you with that. I want you to remember that, no, we do not, we do not hate you, but we love you. And we are committed to uh, preaching the word of God, and that is why we do what we do. So I pray that this broadcast was a blessing to you. Thank you so much. I really do love you guys. I, I am so appreciative of you. Please know that. Uh, thank you for tuning in to Love Broke the Chains with me, your host, Apostle Nataki Tompkins. Please, if you desire to visit or you're looking for a church home, come visit my church. I would love to see you. Uh, we are Church of the Living Waters, Detroit. And we are here in Detroit, Michigan. Our address is 3606 Hendricks Street. You can also find us on cotlwdetroit.org. And if you have any questions or any comments, please, I ask you to send me what it is that you have to lovebrokethechains at gmail.com. God bless you. I love you. And I will see you next week.
Tune in next week to Love Broke the Chain. Follow us on Facebook, Love Broke the Chains, and you can email us at lovebrokethechains at gmail.com. Again, thanks for listening.